Right, hello everybody. Good afternoon. It's um, it's Friday, in case you hadn't realised. I realise it can be quite difficult to keep track of the days. Um, so uh, this is day five um, of uh, lockdown bioinformatics, and um, today I'm gonna take it a little bit easy. I'm gonna do a little bit of a recap of the week that we've just had. Um, in anticipation of a of, of the weekend um and so i'm just going to go back over a few of the things that we talked about try and um pick up some of the gotchas that maybe we came across over the week um and also just some other little tips and tricks that i may have missed as i've gone along so um uh, so I'm not going to do anything massively new today, but hopefully there'll be some useful information in here as we go along. Um, and I suspect that I probably won't be talking for a full hour today, like I have done all week. Um, and then we'll we'll take a look at uh, we'll have a think. I'll have a think over the weekend about about um, what we're going to do next week. Uh, so okay, so let's begin back at the beginning uh, and talk a little bit about the things that we've done this week so um right at the beginning of the week on monday um we started off with uh without even an environment to work in and that's my my aim was always uh to um start right at the beginning as much as possible um in order to walk people through the whole process of getting up and running now what i chose to do um is set up a relatively um unusual environment i guess where the way that, that you would usually approach bioinformatics is, is and approach using linux is probably to use some kind of relatively high performance server that's local to you uh, as a as a Linux environment that gives you not just um, that Linux environment that you need for, for a lot of the tasks that we'll be doing as we go along. Okay, sorry, my um, my software crashed. I'm slightly amazed that that's the first time that's happened this week. So, uh, but there you go, I'm back on hopefully now and uh, should still be in the same place. So I don't think that will have changed anything. Um, anyway, so what was I saying? Um, yes, so like the way that we, in in my unit, in the bioinformatics support unit in Newcastle, uh, the way that we use Linux is on a server that has a lot more... Um, that has a lot more power than the, the machines that we have on our desks. So um, we have uh, we have perfectly respectable machines sitting on our desks, but on this on the server um, that we use primarily, we have uh, three hundred and eighty four gigs of RAM and and um, forty CPU cores. So it has a lot more power, a lot more grunt than the machine that we the machine that sits on our desk. But obviously. Uh, doing this sort of thing on YouTube, I can't make that environment available to everybody, um, and I can't. I also can't guarantee that everybody listening along, even if they're in Newcastle, has has access to to a similar to a similar environment. So instead, what I had to do was set everybody up with um, a unified environment where we're all working in the same way, um, but. Um, without um without me having to provide a, a, a remote environment for everybody to log into and so the way that i chose to do that was to try and set people up with a with a virtual machine that we could run linux in the virtual machine um and everybody would have the same environment but i don't have to set everybody up with a login on on servers that that is not really uh where that's not really appropriate now um, so Monday's less way that we can access that virtual machine in particular ways so that we don't have to have a huge virtual disk, but we can share files with our host operating system. Now, I what I realised, and I realised it at the time that I was doing it, was that this would create 
uh, this is a slightly fiddly way of doing things and it would probably create issues and I think it's probably true to say that um, that that um, that way of doing things has created more has has sort of created more issues this week than any of the other things that we've done uh, getting people up and running on this system has been a significant hurdle so I just wanted to to mention a couple of the things that a couple of the significant issues that cropped up around that, um, and I think what we tended to find as solutions for most of them. So uh, the first big issue that a lot of people had was just not being able to install virtual machines at all on their on their system. And the thing that prevents you from doing that is the settings in what's called the BIOS, which is the machine level settings uh, before the operating system even boots um, that control what the hardware is able to do. And we found quite a few people where virtualization, the ability to run virtual machines had was turned off in the BIOS. Um, and so I think it's in some of the comments on on the first on the first video on YouTube, the first lesson on YouTube, uh, where people have commented um, about about this, and I've tried to find some instructions um, for how to turn virtualization on in the BIOS. Um, it's not straightforward to give those instructions because it's not the same on anybody's. Um, on any two machines different manufacturers have different ways of accessing the bios and the bios will look different so it wasn't very straightforward to try and get come up with ways around that for everybody uh, but hopefully um, there's some links in the comments on the first youtube video that will help if people are having those problems um, i think the other thing that we had problems with was setting up the shared folder so the folder that's shared between the virtual machine and the host machine um, <clears throat> Which we've uh, we've made this folder called share on on in our home directory on on the virtual machine. Um, I think the cause for, of that for most people, and I don't know why, for some people this worked perfectly first time, and it worked for me first time, and why it didn't for others it didn't work. But there are a few um, pieces of software, a few software libraries that some people found they needed to install um, before. The shared folder would work correctly and um, again there is uh, I think there are comments in the first uh, under the first video that point to a thread on the website ask Ubuntu um, which point to those dependencies so I think there are four or five uh, libraries that need to be installed on some systems for reasons beyond my understanding, I'm afraid, uh, to make sure that the host operating system can access that shared directory. Um, so I think those were kind of the significant problems that, that, and we we did, I think, manage to find solutions uh, to those significant problems. Um, I did want to point out a couple of alternatives and, and my motivation for setting this up in, in a virtual machine was so that you could see on your screen what I see on my screen. So when I run the VM, um, my my virtual machine, um, they're all installed from the same ISO, and my virtual machine should look very much like your virtual machine. And um, and so when I do something uh, on my virtual machine, you should be able to replicate that fairly straightforwardly. Um, I would, I hope, anyway, that, that was kind of my goal. But there are alternatives to doing this in a virtual machine. Um, so if you have a, a Mac um, in front of you, so if you're sitting working at a Mac like I am, well, your operating system is Unix-based. You have a, a nice command line interface built into your operating system. Um, and there's an, there's an application on in mac os called terminal which is exactly the same as the or very similar to the terminal emulator that i'm running on zubuntu um, so you can um you can uh uh bring up a terminal on mac os in exactly the same way as you can on on zubuntu um and um the uh the terminal there will has a lot of the same 
tools. So Mac OS already has a lot of the same tools in the current working directory. Uh, I can type PWD, uh, and this is a terminal on my Mac, and is giving it gives me access to a lot of the same tools as Linux does. Um, there are some exceptions. So, for instance, by default, um, uh, Mac OS does not have uh, wget installed. So wget that we used yesterday for accessing data on the internet is not installed on Mac OS. And so that's partly part of the, again, another reason why I didn't want to have to give different instructions for people using Macs and for people using Windows machines. On Windows, uh, there is a more complicated way to get yourself uh, a proper kind of Unix-based command line environment. And that's to install um, something called the Windows subsystem for Linux, uh, which is new in Windows 10. Uh, but it does work very effectively to give you a virtual Linux um, command line environment on a Windows machine. And I've used uh, uh, WSL, the Windows subsystem for Linux, quite extensively myself. There is in the uh, Microsoft Store, there is an application called Ubuntu, which you can install and which gives you effectively an Ubuntu command line on your Windows machine. So there are these, there are alternatives to um, to uh, the um, to installing the virtual machine and getting uh, and using the virtual machine for everything that we're going to do. But I thought, in the interest of everybody having um, a unified environment, and so that everybody would see the same things that I see. Uh, when I'm running stuff uh, in my virtual machine that I was trying to get everybody set up with the same virtual machine as me. Uh, and I think to largely we've managed to troubleshoot most people's installations um, and uh, hopefully that didn't leave too many people behind um, or, or, or by tracking, tracking me down on Twitter or by email. Um, and um, I will do my best to help everybody get up and running. Um, as I said, I think it's been the uh, the single biggest stumbling block for people this week. But hopefully uh, there are enough people. I, I can st see that there are still people following on um, live. Um, and um, uh, so hopefully people are still managing to do things. I've just seen somebody ask... In the comments, uh, they've installed Ubuntu, not Zubuntu. Uh, it makes no functional difference whatsoever. Um, the only difference between Ubuntu and Zubuntu uh, is the graphical interface, is the is the the, the um, graphics over the top, the um, the underpinnings, the stuff that we're using at the command line. Are okay, so just to briefly recap the commands that we've covered so far, uh, so I'll I'll write out a list. Um, and um, and uh, we will uh, just quickly go over the functionality of all of those commands that we've that we've seen so far, uh, and that means it's time for my favourite feature, which is uh, Jacob's picture of the day. So uh, today, Jacob has drawn us this rather a magnificent uh, Tie Fighter, uh, because you know we've got Disney Plus in our house now, and we have kids who are obsessed by Star Wars. Um, so I'm going to leave that up there, uh, and I'm going to going to write out a list of the commands that we've used um, so far this week. So we started on Tuesday with uh, commands for... Um, uh, started on Tuesday with commands for kind of navigating the file system. So um, on Tuesday, um, we, um, we talked about PWD to print your working directory. Um, we talked about CD for changing directory, and we talked about LS for listing the contents um, of, of a directory. Um, then on uh, Wednesday, we talked about um, commands for manipulating files. So we talked about uh, MKDIR for making directories, touch, um, for making files, we talked about um, what else did we talk about? We talked about CP and MV for copying and moving files, respectively. Um, and we talked about RM and RMDIR for removing files and directories. 
um, where uh, RMDIR, if you remember, will uh, only remove uh, directories if they're empty. So we also talked about RM minus R dash R for um, recursively removing files and directories, uh, which would allow us to remove directories if they still had contents. Uh, but we were at great pains to point out that we should be very careful with that command. Uh, so then yesterday, that takes us to yesterday, and yesterday uh, we talked about commands not just for um, not just for creating uh, and and moving files around and manipulating files, but also for actually uh, changing the contents, putting contents into files and changing that contents. So we talked about echo and we talked about cat. And if you remember, we also talked about redirecting the output of those commands using the greater than symbol. So we use greater than for redirecting the contents into a new file or overwriting an existing file. And we talked about using two greater than symbols um, for um, for uh, appending to a file. So not just overwriting the contents of a file, but actually uh, adding stuff to the end of a file. Um, and as with yesterday, um, my, uh, my screen is not necessarily keeping up with my writing um but I, i'm trying to trying to make sure that we can still see what i'm doing okay so um that was echo and cat and that we can use that for putting contents into files should we want to uh, but we would also we also wanted to be able to edit the contents of files and for that i showed you a command line text editor called nano um uh, and then um Finally, the final thing that I showed you yesterday, and I don't think I've forgotten anything, but I'll check in a second. Uh, but the final thing that I showed you yesterday was wget or webget, uh, which we used for downloading um, for downloading uh, data from the internet. And we will be coming back to wget um, uh, in future again for downloading more data um, because. Uh, obviously, in order to analyze data, we need access to that data in the first place, and so so we will be coming back to download the data that we'll be analyzing using using wget and tools like it. Uh, okay, so that's um, um, at least a, a very quick summary of uh, all of the commands that we that we talked about this week. And I did forget one; I knew I did. Uh, less, which is a page application. Um, for uh, looking at the contents of files. So the same as cat will show you the contents of the files. Cat will print the contents of a file to stand it out, whereas less will let you page through a larger file. So um, uh, the thing that we ended up doing at the end of yesterday um, was, um, if I cd into my share directory, um, we used... Um, wget for downloading data from uniprot um, and um, we then so then because that's a large file the text file that we downloaded from uniprot is a large file then less is the best way of looking at that uh, data so uh, less and then the file name will show us the contents of that larger file um, uh, page by page um, so uh, we downloaded the uniport entry for ace2 for the ace2 receptor which is uh, um, the the entry point for for sars uh, for the sars virus the sars coronavirus um, uh, uh, and so um, that's uh, that's a, a sideways interesting at least um, uh, piece of uh, data for us this week so it's quite a useful thing to be able to download um, so that is um, a brief summary of all of the commands that I've mentioned as we've gone along this week pretty much anyway there may have been one or two that I may have mentioned in, uh, in passing but which I've not covered in any detail uh, what I wanted to do for the rest of today um, and um, as I kind of mentioned at the beginning, I'm not necessarily going to uh, 
going to talk for a full hour today because I because it's Friday and because um, we've kind of got four full hours so far this week and I really wanted today to be a bit of a recap with an, a couple of extra pieces of information in there. So um, what I want to talk about for a little while is um, kind of to take those those um, those broad oh, sorry very specific things that we've learned about those very specific commands uh on the various days this week um and to try and uh generalize a little bit to try and tell you a little bit about um about the generalities of running commands on linux um and so um i'm going to talk a little bit about the kind of general anatomy of a of a linux command line command uh, that's certainly true holds true for the commands that we've looked at so far, which are built-in commands. Um, and um, will also hold true for quite a lot of the bioinformatics that we'll look at because desi- the command line programs are written with these kind of uh, philosophies in mind. Um, so um, I'm just going to uh, refresh my browser because it's decided to get out of sync now. So I'm going to um, refresh and try and catch up with where I am. Um, and I'm guessing from the printing that just spewed out of the printer that's next to me that my, my family is also online today, which is perhaps why my whiteboard isn't quite keeping up with me. Uh, right, okay, so um, there we go. I've refreshed and um, got myself... Uh, synced up so okay so we're going to talk about the anatomy of a command more generally so when you run a command uh, commands have several things in common so we're going to use ls as an example so um, when we run ls we've got the command itself this is what's uh, this is what's known as the um, this is the binary or executable command. So that's the command itself. Um, that command uh, with commands in Linux will quite often have a default way of behaving. And ls, we know its default way of behaving uh, is that it lists the contents of our present working directory. Um, but we can modify that behavior using uh, what are called options. So we've seen with ls, we've seen the options dash l and dash h. Okay, so these are options. Um, and these change the behavior of the command. So in this case, the l option gives us the long listing format and the h option makes the file sizes uh, human readable. And then we have, uh, we also have the, the ability to pass our command arguments okay so this is an argument and again this will change the behavior of the command so in this case instead of listing um, the the contents of the current working directory um, it will uh, ls will list the contents of um, of the share directory which we find in our current working directory we could uh, instead of doing that, we could list the contents of uh, slash etc, for instance, list contents of the etc directory that you found you find at the root of your file system. And so, again, an argument uh, or arguments, because you can have more than one, uh, can be a way of changing the behavior of the command, just like options are. Incidentally, options can have their own arguments so you can it can be the case that the options uh, can take a value themselves which modifies the behavior of the option uh, and I I am struggling to think of an example for LS um, but um, uh, for instance there's a command um, which we haven't looked at yet which is head um, so head uh, shows you the first, Uh, by default, the first 10 lines of a file. Um, So if you do head, and then in our arguments over here, we do file name. So if we do head, uh, new file, 
then by default, this command will show us the first 10 lines of new file. Um, but you may want to you may want to change the behavior of head and the, it might not be the first 10 lines that you want to see but maybe you only want to see the first line maybe you want to see maybe it's a, a table and you want to see the column headers so you only want to see the first line of the of the um of the file so head has an option which is dash n and dash n is tells you the number of lines of the file that you want head to show you so by default n is set to 10 um, but you might want to set it to something else. So maybe you want dash N1. Um, so here you've got an option and that option is taking a value. Uh, so to change the behavior of the option, you can give the option a value. So you could say N1 or you could say N100 uh, uh, to show you the first 100 lines of the file. Um, and and so um, this is as configurable as you want it to be. Um, so you could say, show me the first 20 lines of the file rather than the first one or the first 100. And that's uh, that that way of, of configuring, um, and I seem to be writing over and over and over the same thing. So, sorry, uh, this is my, my whiteboard not keeping up with me. Um, but you can set N to whatever you want. Uh, to any number that you want um, to show you a certain number of lines of the file. So that's um, uh, the way that you can give um, values to options. Um, I've always, so far, I've always um, spaced the options out. So I've always kept options as separate from each other. Um, but it is possible to group them together. So uh, you could, instead of doing... Uh, I'm going to go back to my terminal for this. Um, so if we do ls-l-h in our current working directory, you get the long listing format with the human readable file names. Um, you can group those two options together. So ls-lh as a little group of options. Um, that's... Uh, also possible to do, uh, and that will give you exactly the same results. Behave in the same way. Um, I'm gonna gonna respond to the to the question in the comments. I'm trying, to, but it's complicated. Um, so um, the way that you do that, and head doesn't really let you do it. So head will we do head minus n ten, uh, and then q nine b yf1.txt so that shows you the first 10 lines of the file okay so we talked about head now um there's also a, there's another command which is tail so tail does exactly the same as head but instead of um instead of the the first n lines of a file tail shows you the last n lines of a file okay so we can tail q9 b y f1 dot txt and that will show us the last 10 lines of the file um, we can we can use head and tail and output redirection which is something we've already covered to show us to use head and tail at the same time to show us uh, in in this case you're saying the lines between uh, say you're saying the lines 5 to 10 so um, if we did head uh, so if we did the head, lines 1 to 10, we could um, redirect that to a file, so a temporary file, and then we could tail minus n5 temp file, and that will be the lines between 5 and 10 in, in our original file. It's actually possible to combine these two things together because we can redirect the output to another command rather than redirecting it to a file. So um, we can do head minus dash n 10 q9 by f1 dot txt. And then instead of redirecting it to a file, which would be with the the greater than symbol, we can instead redirect it to another command. And we do that with this, uh, if I can find it on my keyboard, this pipe symbol. So this uh, 
this pipe here, uh, instead of redirecting to a file, that pipe, that vertical line, means take the output of this command and redirect it into the next command. So then we can do tail minus n5. This doesn't, we don't need to tell this what file to, to use as input because its input is coming from the previous command. Uh, so we're saying, okay, run head on this file and then run tail on the output of that head command. And this will give you, so the first step gives you the first 10 lines and then the second step gives you the last five lines of that step. And that will give you the the lines between line 5 and line 10 in your file. So the answer to the question in the comments was, yes, there is a way uh, of, of using these tools to show you a particular range of lines, but it isn't straightforward. It isn't as straightforward as you would perhaps like. Um, so there you go, that's using head and tail uh, and an output redirect to show you the lines between 5 and 10 in a file. Um, and we will cover that in more detail um, on another day. Um, but but um, this character uh, here, the, this vertical line, is called a pipe character. And that's how we build, we start to build rudimentary pipelines at the command line is using the pipe. Okay, um, so all of our commands have this general anatomy where we have the name of the command itself, um, some options, and then uh, potentially some arguments as well. So you can see that with that head command um, a couple of lines up. Um, so if we go back in our history to the head command, we have the command itself, that's head, we have uh, the uh, the options and in this case we've got an option that takes a value and then we have the argument and that's the file that we want to operate on in this case um, so that's our the kind of general anatomy of the command and the commands are built like this because of the way that we the way that these commands are interpreted by the command line so at this command line at the command line we're actually running uh, a program a, 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 a program called it's a command line interpreter called a shell um, the shell that we're running by default um, in in Zubuntu is called Bash um, for born again shell stands for born again shell and Bash is the way that these commands are interpreted and what what Bash does when you hit enter on a command is Bash breaks that command up on the spaces in it so it, the spaces in the command are informative and it breaks the command up on the spaces and it knows to do different things with each of the bits of the command. So it knows what to do with the bit of the command that starts with dash n and it knows that the, va the thing that follows dash n is paired with it, travels with it. That's the option that belongs to dash n. And Bash is very clever at breaking these commands up into their constituent pieces and then, and then interpreting the command in the right way. Um, and, uh, Bash in itself is actually uh, gives us a actually gives us a programming language that we can use uh, to do um, to do uh, really constructive things with. So um, some of the things that we've used so far this week, like the output redirection um, uh, greater than symbol, that's a feature of uh, the Bash interpreter. That's a feature of the shell that we're using, um, and it's bash that's taking that greater than symbol and saying that means that i want to take this output and redirect it into a file uh, we can use those features of the bash language to write um uh simple programs and we'll be doing that um maybe next week uh probably next week we'll get around to scripting um so we can we can start to use that language uh for writing programs and for writing scripts and that's where the, the true power of the command line as as an interface for doing bioinformatics really starts to come into its own because that's where we can start to um, automate tasks and do things in a much more kind of high throughput way than we do when we're writing individual commands at the command line one at a time. Um, okay, so um, how do we find out about the options? That's the other thing I wanted to kind of bring up today, which is I'm I'm kind of giving you these commands and I'm telling you, well, there's this know about 
what those options are. Where do I find that information out? Where do you find information out? And this is something which came up in the comments yesterday during during the live stream yesterday. Uh, some people were asking this, um, and the answer generally for the uh, for these uh, command Linux commands that we're using, these built-in commands, is that there's a thing called a manual page. So there is uh, documentation on the system for all of the commands that we're using. And we can access that documentation using a command because we're at the command line. And the command that we use for accessing the documentation is man. Uh, so man is short for manual. Uh, so in this case, we can access manual pages for commands by giving the command that we're interested in as an argument. So if we want the man page for ls, we type man ls and we get back the documentation for ls and this is opened in a pager application so this is opened in uh, either more or less i'm not sure which one um so um we've got our this is our man page for ls and it describes the ls command so at the very top it tells us what it does so ls lists directory contents um and then it gives you the basic form for using it so this is the anatomy that I was just talking about of the command. So you've got ls and then the options and then the arguments, which is a directory or file. And then it tells you uh, more about what it does and it gives you all of the options here. So all of the options which you can possibly give to ls. So we could scan through this and we could find the options that we've been using. Um, so dash h um, for human readable. Um, all of a lot of these options have a long for, have a short form, this dash h form, and a long form, which usually starts with two dashes. Um, you don't usually use the long form when you're just typing out commands um, at the command line, but they can be useful, especially in scripts. If you want your script to be a bit more self-documenting, then the long form of the options is ve very often makes a bit more sense um, than than the short form. So, for instance, the, the long form of dash H is dash dash human dash readable, which much, says much more clearly what it is that the dash H option does. Um, so um, this, this is the man page for, um, for LS. And if you want to know how to uh, change the behavior of LS in particular ways, then this will tell you. So one of the things which... I find quite useful, for instance, is uh, the option, I'm just find, see if I can find it in here now. Um, there's an option which is dash one, which doesn't sound, uh, initially doesn't sound like it would be very useful. I'm just scanning uh, the man page for it. Um, dash one uh, changes the output in uh, the same way as dash L changes the output. Here we are. So dash one, uh, ensures that ls lists one file per line so this can be useful in lots so ls by default uh, gives you this listing across the page so you've got files listed uh, in, in this wide format but quite often uh, it is often the case that you want a list of um, the files in a particular directory in a way that you can um, iterate over them one at a time and it can be quite useful to split them up on different lines so ls-1 will do that for you it'll give you the, those those files uh, one line at a time um, somebody also asked me uh, I think somebody also asked in the, in the comments yesterday uh, how you get the colors in ls because um, it's not always the case that your operating system by default gives you the colors um, in ls so the color co doesn't always color in the directories um, and color in the um, uh, color in the files in different ways for different things um, there's an option for ls which is uh, my dash dash uh, color usually spelt the american way and that will ensure that you get the colors so even if you're if you're doing this at the um, at the Mac command line, so Mac by default doesn't color in the results of its ls, but if you do ls dash dash color, it will give you the colored in version of the results, which can be quite a useful thing uh, to be able to do. Uh, and I by def I've got my my Mac set up, so it does that by default. Um, okay, um, so that's uh, man pages, and uh, we will increasingly 
be using man pages to find out appropriate options for tools as we go along. And all of the tools that come installed with your Linux operating system uh, should should have a man page and you should be able to use man to find out how they work, what the options are and how those options uh, work. Um, so that's, um, that's man. And the final thing that I wanted to do today was just give some little uh, sort of tips and tricks about um, how um, uh, uh, the kind of general day-to-day -day getting by at the command line, um, which I think quite often um, these, uh, le these little tips get forgotten. And I forget that I've spent... Uh, the last 15 years working at the command line and um, perhaps uh, I, I I just do things by second nature that, that I forget that other people don't necessarily know how to do. So I just wanted to give some, some a, a few little a few little tricks that will make your life easier when you're working at the command line. So um, there's four things I wanted to talk about. The first of those is um, your command history. So Every time you type a command in at the command line and hit enter, that command is saved by the system, uh, and and you can you you can access all of those commands that you've run in the past. Uh, and there's a command for it, so you can type history. And history will, as the name suggests, show you the history of all of the commands that you've typed. So here, after I've typed history, on the screen is printed a list of all of the commands that I've typed at the uh, at the command line since I installed this system. So it's surprisingly few when you think we've been doing this for a few days now and I've been typing quite a lot of commands. Uh, it's not as many as you would think, uh, but that's mostly because uh, the, the, the commands are only saved when you cleanly exit the system. And I think I shut my system down before um, without having cleanly exited. So it's not saved all of the commands. So if you want to save all of the commands in, in uh, if you want to lock them into your history file, then you have to type exit uh, cleanly uh, to, to exit your terminal and make sure that those things are saved. So that's your history. You can also cycle through your command history, and we looked at this very briefly yesterday by using the up arrow on the on the keyboard. So if you use the up arrow on the keyboard, it's taking me back through the commands that I've typed today. So it's working my way back through that history. Okay, so up takes me back, and down brings me back towards the present. So once you've gone up a few times, you can go down to come back towards the present. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to mention with regards to the command line history, and that's the fact that it's searchable. So um, a feature of the shell that we're using, so a feature of Bash, is that it gives you a searchable command line history. To access that search, you press Control and R. And when you press Control and R, your prompt changes to show you this search. And if you begin to type um, uh, a command that you think you've typed before in the past, uh, it, it will use this search function to find matching entries in your history. Um, so uh, H, I, S, and you can see that in my history, I only ha I have this command that matches it. This is the most recent command that I ran that matches uh, H, I, S and its history. And if you just hit enter, it will rerun that command for you. Uh, the other thing is when you're looking at this history, if you want to rerun any of these commands in your history, then you can do that using exclamation mark and the number of the command. So you can, each of the commands that I've run has a number. So if I do exclamation mark and then a number, so I'm going to rerun um, 67, command 67. So exclamation mark um, uh, 67 will um, rerun command 67. Um, uh, and command 67 was man ls. Okay, so this will rerun that command and will show you the man page for ls. Um, uh, the person in the comments saying ls dash dash color isn't working. Try if you're on a Mac, try ls dash capital G. Uh, that might work instead. Um, uh, give that a shot and see if that works. Um, I'm guessing. 
but maybe that will work. Uh, okay, so that's our man page. Uh, so it's rerun uh, command number 67. So that's some features of your command line history. And re being able to rerun commands that you've run before uh, can be extremely useful, especially when our commands start to get quite big and quite complicated. Um, and also being able to access those commands and edit them is also quite useful. Uh, uh, and um, I'm just going to try something here. No, it doesn't work. Okay, so... Um, so the final thing that I wanted to talk about in terms of making your life easier is um, is the tab key. Uh, and the tab key is absolutely your friend at the command line. So um, the tab key sits is the key that sits above caps lock on your keyboard, on most, most uh, uh, PC and Mac keyboards. You've got a tab key above your caps lock key. And the tab key uh, gives you access to a thing called... Uh, called uh, command completion. So if you're running a long command or you're looking for a long file name, uh, tab can really, really help you out and can help help you avoid um, typos. So can can really um, uh, help you if you're if you're if you kind of struggle with typos, which I know I do from quite a lot of the time. So um, to show you what I mean, um, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to um, uh, first of all, I'm going to make. Uh, I'm going to. I'm going to. Uh, right. I'm going to um, echo uh, some text into a file with a really long file name. Okay. So this file has a really long name. Okay, so obviously this is not a particularly realistic situation, but you do quite often, especially with sequencing, uh, end up with files with really long names because the sequencer, when you when you do a sequencing experiment, the Illumina sequencer has a tendency to encode loads and loads of metadata in the file name. So you end up with these really long file names. So actually having very long file names, very long paths is not, is not an uncommon experience. Um, now, if I want to... Um, have a look at the contents of that file. So if I'm going to use my cat command to look at the text that's in that file, um, if I do what I've been doing all week and type out the file name, I have to, A, it's very long, and I have to be really careful to make sure that I don't make any mistakes as a really long see and i've made a typo right so that's there we go long name so i've made a typo when i'm typing that really long file which obviously the longer the file name is uh, the more likely it is that you're going to make that typo so when i try to cat that file it's going to tell me it doesn't exist and i'm going to get frustrated um but the tab key is my friend here okay so if i type cat and then start to type the file name so I'm just going to type the first character of the file name, and then I'm going to press the tab the tab key. So the tab key, remember, is the key that sits above the caps lock key. So I'm just going to hit the tab key, and the shell, bash, has really nicely for me um, taken that T, and it's looked for, in my current working directory, it's looked for all of the files that begin with the character T, and it's guessed what I've tried to type. Now there is only one file in my current working directory that begins with T. So it has, from that file name, it has, from just that one character, it's managed to guess the whole file name that I want to type out. And um, so without having to, um, without having to, uh, uh, do all of that typing, and in that really error-prone way, I've managed to type my really long file name. So tab really helped me there. If I had more than one file with uh, a really long file name, so let's do touch. This file has another long name. So, okay, we've got two files with, with similar names, um, uh, and I want to cat one of them. Then I do cat and type T. This time, it's not going to manage to get all the way to the end of that file name for me because I have two files which begin with the same thing. So I have this file has a really long name and I have this file has another long name and they both start with this file has a. And so in this case, tab complete doesn't get to the end for me. Um, so... Um, 
what I can do in this situation is I can press, if I press tab a second time, so if I press tab twice, then um, my command line is giving me the options. It's telling me the two files that match this pattern. And then if I type one more character, so if I want this file has a really long name, if I type the R that comes next, now this, this can only possibly complete to one thing, uh, which is this file has a really long name, because this file has another name, would have an N next, not an R. So now if I press tab again, it will manage to finish the file name for me, um, and um, that's really helpful. It's just a very useful thing to be able to do. Um, so the tab, the tab key is your friend when you're at the command line, and... Uh, uh, um, uh, you will find yourself pressing that key a lot if you use the command line a lot. You'll you'll increasingly find that that as you're um, typing out file names and file paths, then using the tab key is a really quick way of of achieving lots and lots of typing in a much less error prone way than than by typing everything out by hand. So get used to um, things like. Um, um, uh, typing the beginning of something and then pressing tab um, or uh, if you don't know what's in a particular directory so I don't know what's in the etc directory if you press tab twice uh, you get all of the possibilities so everything that's contained in that directory um, and then you can pick one uh, and again and I could f I found that there was nothing in it just by using the tab character okay so that's a, it's an extremely useful thing to know about so that's just to round off the week. There was just a few tips and tricks about the the uh, command line history and particularly about tab completion, which is which which can be really helpful. OK, so with that, I'm going to round off. I'm going to end um, for the week. Um, I want to very much thank everybody that's joined me this week. Um, uh, 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 I know this is entirely new to me. I've not done anything like it before. Although I've provided training, I've never provided training in this kind of environment where you don't necessarily get immediate feedback from the people looking at you. You don't get the looks of confusion on people's faces or the looks of enlightenment if they've understood what you've said. Um, so it's been really, um, it's been a, an interesting experience to me, um, for me. And what's been nice is seeing people tuning in and seeing the same names in the comments every day, uh, and, and knowing that, that there are people who are coming back, uh, every day. And so my aim then for future weeks is to carry this on, uh, 4 PM. It will be BST from next week, because for those of you in the UK, uh, the clocks go forward this weekend. Don't forget. Um, so it will be 4 PM G uh, BST from next week. Uh, but I will be here uh, as much as I can every day at that time uh, and um, we'll carry on our, our bioinformatics journey, as my colleague John would call it, together. Uh, so, so thanks, everyone, and see you next week. Have a good weekend and keep safe and keep well. Bye.